Uh, good, good evening to everyone. I think we're ready to begin. Great. Am I, am I audible? Good, thank you. A very warm welcome on a chilly evening to everyone here in London at the Society of Antiquaries and to those of us following online. Um, in the absence of our secretary, Karen Limper Hertz, let me ask our treasurer, Matthew Payne, to read the minutes from the last meeting. Uh, the second meeting of the 131st season took place at Senate House, London, and online via Zoom on Tuesday, the 12th of December, 2023. Mr. Richard Linnethorn, president, was in the chair. After the minutes of the previous meeting had been read and signed, the president introduced Dr. Owen Emerson and Ms. Kate McCaffrey, who delivered a paper entitled, Rediscovering Thomas Cromwell's Lost Book of Hours. When the meeting was open to discussion, the following took part. The president... Professor Miriam Foote, Professor Nicholas Pickwode, Professor Tony Edwards, Dr. Nicholas Bell, Dr. David Shaw, Dr. David Pearson, and Dr. Mark Byford. The President thanked the speakers warmly for their paper. Thank you, Matthew. Is this Sorry. an accurate record? Thank you. Thank you again, Matthew. Uh, before introducing today's speaker, let, let me mention the next date in our diary of activities. At the end of this month, on Wednesday, the 31st of January, we will be visiting virtually the Cairo Geniza at Cambridge University Library. Our hosts on that occasion will be Ben Outhwaite and Nick Posgay, and details can be found on the Society's website. This promises to be a fascinating introduction to the more than 200,000 medieval fragments, originally discarded in the Egyptian synagogue's storeroom, and now one of the greatest single collections of Jewish and Islamic writings in the world. Uh, with regard to other activities, the uh, council will soon be deciding on this year's research grant recipients. And I hope members have enjoyed the recent virtual issue of the library, where Tony Edwards has selected articles on Middle English works from manuscript to print. Once again, details can be found on the Society's website. And last but not least, I cannot neglect to mention the splendidly branded Bibsock pencil, which arrived with the December issue of the journal, and which oh so clearly is the perfect complement to last year's tote bag. Uh, a word more about the tote bag. It may not be generally known, even to members of council, that it is thanks to this very same tote bag that we have our speaker here today. More than a year ago, I was sitting next to Ramey Jimenez at a dinner. We had never met before, and when I mentioned my involvement with the Bibliographical Society, he looked at me with awe, he whipped out his phone, and he showed me his latest posting on social media, displaying none other than our glorious and at that time very new tote bag. Here was a man not only with great taste, but I soon discovered that he is a leading authority on 16th century French typography. Rémy Germanus is a lecturer at the Centre d'Etudes Supérieure de la Renaissance at the University of Tours. He wrote his doctoral thesis on the woman printer Charlotte Guillard, and he is mainly interested in the history of typographic forms and practices in 16th century Paris. He has published a book on civilité types in 2011 and an exhibition catalog on Geoffrey Torrey in 2019. He has been interested in Claude Garamond for over 10 years, and he has just published a biography of Garamond which is dedicated to the memory of the late Hendrik Verfleet. At the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity for questions. For those following us online, please use the chat function as usual, and we would be grateful if you could provide your name for clarity. Today's talk is being recorded and will be available in due course through the Society's website. Over now to Rémy Jiménez, who will speak to us about Claude Garamond with a focus 
on his years in service in the service of King Francois Premier. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. I hope you will be able to understand me too. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of this conference for their invitation, and especially Richard here. He told you about the, the tote bag thing, so you know everything. Um, the name of Garamond is now famous. It is the symbol of classicism in typography. It is part of universal culture for all peoples who use the Latin alphabet. The name is cited in the imprint of the American editions of Harry Potter. This is an interesting thing. And we all have a digital font named Garamond in our computer. This name is that of a French punch cutter and letter, letter designer who was born and died in Paris in the 16th century. For those who want to find out more about the life and work of Claude Garamond, the starting point for any research is Hendrik Verflitz's book, French Renaissance Printing Types, a Conspectus, published in 2010 by the Bibliographical Society. Since then, however, the research has continued. I would like to mention James Mosley's article on Garamond, published on his blog in 2011, and since reprinted in the Journal of the Printing Historical Society. More recently, Guillaume Berton and Dirk Wursten discovered new docu documents relating to Claude Garamond in the correspondence of the Strasbourg printer Rémi Guédon. And William Kemp, published an article devoted to Garamond's first type in the Bulletin du Bibliophile last year. For my part, after having been interested in Garamond's career for 15 years, I published a paper in 2020 in which I proposed the hypothesis that Claude Garamond might have been involved in a royal printing project, which I will tell you today, tell you about today. This article formed the basis of a book a genuine biography of Claude Garamond, published last year by the Edition des Cendres. As I said, Garamond is a very famous punch cutter. His reputation dates back to the 16th century. Garamond appeared in a list of 144 illustrious French men, published in the beginning of the 17th century by the printer Jean Leclerc. His portrait is at the end of the plate, along with those of the printers Robert Estienne and Christopher Plantin. To my knowledge, it is the only portrait of a Renaissance punch cutter that we have. Garamond is so famous that I'm afraid it has been given too much credit. For a long time, he was credited with engraving the Roman types whose matrices are held by the Imprimerie Nationale. But thanks to the work of Beatrice Ward in 1926, we know that it is not true and that the punch cutter of this type is Jean Janon. For a long time, one thought that Claude Garamond was the creator of the Aldine Roman types introduced in Paris by Robert Estienne in September 1530. These types, which are the archetype of the Garamond font, represented a revolution in book design. Here is how Nicholas Barker described them. The new style of Roman face, which came in at the beginning of the 1530s, swept through Paris with the force of a revolution. It was a turning point in the history of typography. But thanks to the work of Hendrik Verflitz, we know now that Garamond was not the cutter of these types, for which the designer still remains unknown yet. So, Garamond may have been given too much credit. The fact is that he was not the only talented punch cutter of his time. And for sure, he was not the most creative of his time. From this point of view, in my opinion, Robert Grandjean's work seems to me to be as just interesting as Garamond's. Yet it is Garamond's name that has gone down in history. 
So the question arises as to why Garamond has been given so much credit. Why did he become so famous? My aim in this talk will be to focus on a key episode that could explain not only his career, but also his reputation in the time. It is his work to the service of the King Francis I, King of France. Let's start by looking at who Claude Garamond was and where he came from. He was born in Paris about 1510, maybe 1515. Nothing was known about his social background until the year 2010, when Thierry Claire, Geneviève Guimineau, and I discovered an archive document dating from 1528, mentioning Claude Garamond's father, Yvon Garamour. In this contract, Yvon is said to be a printer. But as we know of no work bearing his name, he was probably a journeyman working for a master printer. The name Garamour is extremely rare in France, and that's lucky, because we know that it is a name of Breton origin. We can only find it around the city of Morlaix. The first name Yvon confirms its Breton origin, as Saint-Yves is the patron saint of Brittany. In Paris, we know of one master printer who came from Morlaix. His name was, oh, so here is Morlaix in Brittany. We know from, we know about one master printer coming from Morlaix. His name is Guillaume Anaba. He specialized in printing liturgical books and books of hours. As he came from the same region as Anaba, we can suppose that Yvon Garamour may have worked for him, or at least that he must have had contact with him. And the thing is interesting, because Anaba pretended to be expert in the art of typecutting in the colophon of his books of hours. Garamond's mother was Françoise Barbier. She cited in the same contract dating from 1528. The name Barbier is very common in France, but we can guess, it's not sure, but we can guess that she may be the sister of the printer Symphorien Barbier, a Parisian printer, who also worked as a type founder, as in 1515, he sold the font of type to a printer from Troyes, Nicolas Le Rouge. Thanks to this information, we can easily understand the testimony of Garamond, who stated in 1545 that he had been introduced to type engraving from a very young age. Unfortunately, we don't know anything more about Garamond's origin. But what we know is that as he was born in Paris, he decided to change his Breton name for a more French sounding one, Garamond. Although this name sounds completely French, it is important to note that it has been invented. The name Garamond never existed in the Kingdom of France. Before Claude, there was nobody named Garamond. And as he died without an heir, there was nobody after him. Garamond began his apprenticeship when he was a teenager. It was in the end of the 1520s or in the very beginning of the 1530s. This time was a crucial period for French typography. I have already mentioned the diffusion of the Aldin Roman face in Paris, which was introduced by Robert Estienne in September 1530. I can also mention the publication of the treatise Champ Fleury by Geoffroy Tory in 1529, which was dedicated to the design of Roman capitals. Claude Garamond chose Antoine Augereau as his master. Augereau was a fascinating figure, figure. A printer and a punch cutter, he played a very active role in the spread of Aldin Roman face in Paris in the 1530s. He never used Gothic type, which is unique in Parisian printing of the time. 
Augereau cut very fine Roman typefaces, which he used in particular to print books in French. And this is also exceptional at a period of time when the French language was printed in black letter. Augereau was a Protestant. He was executed on Christmas, Christmas Day in 1534. He was hung and burned on the Place Maubert. His execution must have been a major event in Garamond's life. Hendrik Fairfleet thought that Garamond had, had, had not had time to complete his training. However, it seems to me that Garamond was already active in the end of 1534. Two elements allow me to make this assumption. Firstly, the, appear the appearance in Lyon in May 1535 of the first typeface engraved by Garamond, to which William Cape de Kemp devoted a paper last year. This type is on Gros Canon size, and it is a very good copy of the Gros Canon introduced by Robert Estienne in 1530. If this typeface is used in Lyon in May 1535, Sorry. <laughs> in the spring of 1535, this means that Garamond was already active at the beginning of the year. In addition, Guillaume Berton discovered a letter from the printer Rémy Guédon, which mentions Claude Garamond's daughter, Claire, as being of marriageable age in 1549, which means that she must have been born before 1535. If Garamond was already married by that date, he must, had had, he must had completed his apprenticeship. So Garamond began his career in the beginning of 1535 at the latest. He engraved his first punches, but his activity was not enough to support him. He had to earn a living. He therefore worked as a type founder for a very important print house, the Soleil d'Or, run by Claude Chevalot and his wife, Charlotte Guillard. This workshop specialized in publishing Christian sources. It published imposing editions of the church fathers, such as, as the complete works of St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. John Chrysostom, and others. In addition to his work as a typecaster, Garamond also made use of his training as a punch cutter for the Soleil d'Or. In 1538, he engraved an elegant bourgeois or Galliard type, Roman type. It was also for Charlotte Guillard that he cut his first italic type on great primer body size, this one, in 1540. And it was while working at the Soleil d'Or that Garamond met Jean de Gagny, a man who was to change his life forever. In patristics, which was one of the print shop specialities, Claude Chevalon and Charlotte Guillard relied on the work of a small group of humanist theologians connected to the College of Navarre and the Chartreuse Monastery in Vauvert. Chief amongst them was Jean de Gagny, the first chaplain of King Francis I, and a remarkable personage. This doctor of theology was well known and well respected for his studies. He was rector of the university in 1532 and chancellor in 1546. He was trained in Greek and Hebrew. In addition to his work as a philologist, he was also an important bibliophile, purchasing Aldin editions and unscience manuscripts. Following all indications, it was at the Soleil d'Or by 1538, that Claude Garamond became acquainted with Jean de Gagny. The timing was excellent, as the king's chaplain had an ambitious printing project that would necessitate the presence of a type cutter. A few years later, the punch cutter Garamond would go on to describe the role played by Gagny in his career. It was Jean de Gagny, first on honor of the most Christian king a man of great merit in the Republic of Letters, both for his commentaries on the Holy Writ and for his editions of the works of wise and pious men who devised and instigating this 
instigated this plan. He had decided that I could bring some ornament to the book trade through my knowledge of engraving and type foundry, which I have studied since I was a small child, yet with little gain to my household. He urged zealous men with all his benevolence that I, who used to cut and cast type, should be able to reap the rewards of my work. So what was the project in which Jean de Gagny was involved by the time? From the beginning of his reign, King Francis I had announced the forthcoming creation of a magnificent Collège Royal, dedicated to the teaching of Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. I, can I put this away? Because you can't read any title on, in my slide. Is it OK? <laughs> Um, in 1517, Guillaume Budet, one of the king's counselors, had tried to recruit Erasmus to teach in this college, but Erasmus refused, and the college had never been built. In 1530, the king appointed the first royal teachers, but did not build the college he had announced. On the 29th of September, 1539, King Francis announced that the project would be resumed. We have deliberated and resolved to construct and edify at our lodge and quarters of the Nail at Paris and elsewhere nearby, which we have delimited, a beautiful and great college that will be called the College of Three Languages, accompanied by a beautiful and sumptuous church with other buildings whose portraits and designs have been made and projected. The future college was to be a spectacular building. It was conceived as a fair in which there would be nothing but the literary trade. And it was to receive 600 students. The oversight of the construction was placed in the hands of the treasurer, treasurer Jean Grolier. For this future college, the king wanted to create an immense library. The ordinance of Montpellier, given on the 28th of December, 1537, confirmed this wish. We have deliberated and decided to obtain place and assemble in our library all works worthy of being studied and read that have been and will be compiled, amplified, corrected, and amended in our time, so as to have recourse to the said books if by chance they are subsequently lost to the, memory, to the memory of men or completely changed or varied from their true and first publication. In the following months, the correspondence of Francis I confirms his intention of construct, constructing a wonderful library. To this end, emissaries spread out Europe, spread out across Europe and above all in Italy in the search of Greek manuscripts. These books were, of course, to be communicated to the students through the Futures College Library. But the aim was also to assure the, great, the largest possible diffusion for them by using typography. And Jean de Gagny claimed to be in charge of this project. In 1538, in a long preface published by the Soleil d'Or, Godfrey Tillman a Carthusian monk, explained that Jean de Gagny had conceived a brilliant project, most worthy of recognition. Convinced that printing must play an essential role in protecting and diffusing of ancient texts, Gagny obtained from the King Francis the authorization to visit the libraries of the principal monasteries in the Kingdom of France in search of forgotten texts, and then having such texts printed. In a preface addressed to the king in 1540, Jean de Gagny explained that he has been in charge by the king to print the most important text of the Christian tradition. Well understanding how oh, fragile and in, in, and in almost failed condition these inferior things are, knowing also how oh, many beautiful and sumptuous buildings have been rapidly destroyed, you have decided not to assemble nor put together libraries before first working for the common good and for the benefits of the Republic of Philology. In this way, good and old books are transferred to be correctly printed. 
having been entrusted with carrying out your will, since I have several excellent books worthy of assembling and the inspe inspection of scholars, I chose to begin with the one that I knew was in your possession. To accompany this cultural policy, from the start of 1539, the crown reinforced its link with the printers by creating several new royal printers. In January 1539, Conrad Neobar was named printer for Greek. In June, Robert Hestien was charged as king's printer for Hebrew and Latin languages, and Étienne Roffet as a royal bookbinder. In 1540, Pierre Athénian was commissioned king's printer for music. And in April 1543, a position of king's printer for the French language was finally created for Denis Janot. The exceptional nature of the naming of Conrad Neobar as a royal printer for Greek deserves comment. In fact, all the other royal printers that I, that I mentioned, Robert Estienne, Pierre Atenian, Denis Janot, they were all well-established printers for many years at the time of their nomination. Through their work, they had already drawn the attention of the sovereign who gave them his confidence. The case of Neobar is completely different. When Francis I recruited him as a Greek typographer, the young Hellenist had never worked as a printer. He was a scholar. Originally from Cologne, he had been a corrector in the shop of Chrétien Véchel since 1536. Because Neobar was named Imprimeur du Roi, book historians have had attended to see him as a technician, which is wrong. Research has shown that Neobar was, on the contrary, a true philologist, capable of collating ancient manuscripts in order to establish their text. Appointed on the 17th of January 1539, Neobar only published his first edition five months later, in May. It was an edition of Cleomid's treatise on the movement of the celestial bodies. This is the, the first book printed by Neobar. This delay is best understood by considering that Neobar had to create a workshop ex nihilo. He had to purchase a press, to buy paper, to recruit workers, to have Greek letters cast, and so on. It was during the creation of Neobar Print House that Claude Garamond appeared. Nobody, nobody seems to have mentioned it, but it is remarkable that from the beginning of Neobar's activity, all the Latin type he used were Garamond's face. And there is more. Neobar seems to have possessed the totality of the types cut by the young Garamond up to that point. So we must conclude that thanks to Jean de Gagny, and despite his lack of experience, the young Claude Garabon had been appointed as the official supplier of Conrad Neobar's print house. There remained the difficult problem of the Greek typefaces that, they, that were supposed to constitute the, special, the specialty of the printer. Claude Garamond had never engraved any, and he was clearly not in, in a position to furnish the print shop. So during the first few months of his activity, Neobar had to do with two old firms, an old-fashioned pica attributed to Jean Vatel, going back to 1521, and another type of Germanic origin attributed to Johann Petri at Basel. These typefaces were quite insufficient for the royal printer, and Garamond soon set to work right off. He began probably in 1539 to, by cutting a St. Augustine Greek created specifically for Neobar's print shop. Lacking a model to imitate, he copied as closely as possible the Greek typeface engraved by Antoine Augereau, his master, in 1532. For the time, here is the type. 
for the time, it was a remarkable type, much better than any Greek type ever cut in Paris. The creation of such a typeface with its numerous ligatures, graphic variants, and dia diacritical signs required a consider considerable amount of work, representing something like 200 punches. So Conrad Neobar had to wait until the middle of the year 1540 in order to obtain its first Garamond Greek font. The work was achieved in June 1540. Neobar immediately put it to use, printing an edition of Epictetus and Chiridion. And for the first time, for the very first time, on the title page of, his, of this work, Neobar print house was described as a Regia Greca Typographia, a royal Greek print shop. Unfortunately, in the week following the, the delivery of this font to Neobar, the printer died. His death had a major impact on the circle of Parisian humanists, but he did not put an end to the project of creating a Regia Greca typographia. And it was the time when Garamond received a new command. Thanks to the research of Annie Parent Charon, we know the details of the contract that Garamond signed with Pierre Duchatel, the representative of the king on the 2nd of November, 1540. Robert Estienne, which was Pierre Duchatel protégé, was here because he had succeeded to Conrad Neobar and became royal printer for Greek language too. Claude Garamond accepted to produce and engrave punches and letters in such a way and of the sort and size required to make strikes and justify them and make them ready for casting and this for the price of 22 sous, six deniers tournois, which he will be paid for each punch as he delivers them. These types, which would rapidly become known as the Grec du Roi, the Royal Greeks, constituted the high point of the young Claude Garamond's career. They had to reproduce the handwriting of Angelos Vergicios, which was an impressively cursive end Ange Verges in French. And this is the result of Garamond's work. The work lasted 10 years, and Garamond successively engraved this face on three different bodies. The first was ready in 1543. Almost immediately, Estienne produced a specimen. Oh, these are the, the punches which are kept by the Imprimerie Nationale still today. Um, Estienne produced a type specimen in the form of a small alphabetum gre grecum, a simple school booklet. But in June 1544, Robert Estienne published the Ecclesiastice Historiae Libri Decem by Eusebius of Caesarea. This was the first part of an ambitious program of publication announced at the end of the 1530s. The title page of this majestic folio edition affirmed the omnipotence of the monarch by specifying at once the position of the printer, typography regi, the origin of the type, regis typis, and the exclusivity of the text, cum privilegio regis. Between 1544 and 1550 appeared, appeared roughly 20 volumes bearing the label Ex Bibliotheca Regia. The last book printed in Paris by Robert Estienne was the 1550 New Testament in folio that Olivier Reverdin has described as one of the most beautiful books that, er, that has ever been printed. The history of the Grec du Roi is well known, but in my opinion, the interesting fact is the background in which these types were created. Let's go back to the year 1540. As soon as the Royal Greeks were fully funded, Garamond went right to work. According to archival evidence, we can assume that he had cut about 200 punches before October 1541. In spite of this colossal enterprise, he continued his normal work as a type founder. On the 6th of April, 1541, 
for the sum of 15 écus, he sold to the printer Mathurin Dupuis a strike of mattresses. At that date, he lived in the Rue Saint-Jacques, in the center of the Quartier Latin, in Paris. Uh, the north is on the left. <laughs> um, then, there is no mention of Claude Garamond in the archives, prior to a contract signed in 1543. At that point, point, his situation seems to have completely changed. This contract revealed that Garamond lived now Rue des Augustins. There, in the West. In fact, Garamond in 1543 is working, was working with his brother-in-law Pierre Gauthier at the sign of the ostrich à l'enseigne de l'autruche, rue des Augustes. Garamond had now set up in a peripheral zone outside the Latin Quarter, some distance from the other printers and booksellers. It is hard to understand what might have led him to work so far from his book buying clients. What could have motivated such a move? To answer this question, we must examine, examine what Garamond was doing between summer 1541 and spring 1543. And further info information can be gleaned from an unexpected and atypical source, the autobiography of the Florentine goldsmith Benvenuto Cellini. This Florentine artist was invited to France by King Francis I. He arrived in December 1540. The king has to provide him a workshop, and he proposed that Cellini occupy the Hôtel de Nel. The Hôtel de Nel was a spacious castle in front of the Louvre on the left bank of the River Seine. The hotel constituted for the king an ideal location to install Cellini's workshop for sculpture. So here is the Hotel de Nel on the right. The Louvre is in front of it there. And here is an engraving from the 17th century that where you can see the Louvre and the, the, the Hotel de Nel. When he arrived at the Hotel de Nel, Benvenuto Cellini took it over as if he were the real owner. He progressively expelled its other occupants. And the interesting point is that Cellini explained that he had many difficulties when he tried to expel a print shop that had previously received permission to work here. The place contained some small rooms which were lived, by, which were lived in by various people, including among them a very expert book printer. He had nearly all his workshop inside the castle, and it was he who printed for Messer Guido his first fine book on medicine. As I wanted to make use of these apartments, I sent him away, though not without considerable difficulty. Cellini did not date this event precisely, but the chronological succession of his memoir makes it possible to project that the workers were ejected at the end of 1542 or at the beginning of 1543. The very expert book printer who produced Guido Guidi's Chirurgia at the Hotel de Nel and was expelled by Cellini can be identified quite easily. It was Pierre Gauthier, Garamond's brother-in-law, with whom he lived in 1543. Hence, we can assume that if Claude Garamond lived with Gauthier Rue des Augustins in 1543, he must have been with Gauthier at the, Nel, at the Hotel de Nel at the time before Cellini forced them to dismantle the print shop. The fact that Claude Garamond and Pierre Gauthier have lived in the Hotel de Nel, in an apartment belonging to the king, had been noticed by Jeanne Vérin Forêt. But she did not try to understand what were Garamond and Gauthier doing in this place. How could we explain that they have received the right to establish a print house in a building that belonged to the king? And the answer to this question can be found in the history of the Royal College project. In fact, the Hotel de Nel was the place that the king had chosen to establish his royal college. In 1521, 
The king had ordered, had ordered the removal of the archive of the University of Paris to free up the Hotel de Nel, where he wanted to set up a college to teach Greek. In September 1539, the project had been resumed, as we have seen. We have decided to build in our house at Nel in Paris a large and beautiful college. The fact that Garamond and his brother-in-law were active as printers in the Hotel de Nel in 1542 and, 15, and in the beginning of 1543 can only mean one thing, in my opinion, that King Francis I wanted to create a print house associated with his royal college. This assumption is confirmed by Guillaume Postel, who described the royal project in one of his manuscripts, written in the 1560s. The king had prepared the typographic material and the library for the impressive academy that he had decided to construct in, repli in replacement of the Nel Hotel with a bridge to cross over to the royal palace or the Palace de Bourbon. But an unexpected death caused this, this project to abort. Jean de Gagny, Garamond's powerful protector, was certainly one of the original backers of this project. And in fact, I wonder whether there would, I think there were two competing projects, in fact. The establishing of a print house in the Royal College was supported by Jean de Gagny, and this explains why Garamond was involved. But Pierre Duchatel, who was another powerful cultural advisor to the king, was supporting the work of Robert Estienne. These two projects were not really compatible. In fact, Jean de Gagny was an outspoken critic of Robert Estienne. Doctor of the Faculty of Theology, the king's almoner was fully aware of the religious convictions that drove Estienne, who was an adherent of the reform. Robert Estienne's involvement in the command of the royal Greek types and his nomination as royal printer were more than enough to bother Jean de Gagny, who was afraid, afraid that Estienne's religious sentiments would discredit the king's cultural policy. And I think this is what probably, uh, this is probably what pushed Jean de Gagny to propose an alternative solution to the king, the creation of a print shop closely connected to the future royal college. By choosing to set up a print shop within the walls of the Nel Hotel on a land, a land belonging to the king, across from the Louvre and outside of the university zones, Jean de Gagny underlined the desire to keep away from the traditional structures of publishing. The recruiting of two technicians, both were simple type founders, Garamond and Gauthier, never having worked as merchant bookseller, nor as printer, expresses perhaps a desire to avoid the constraints and the risks involved in collaborating with printer booksellers whose publication follows first and foremost economic imperatives. So all these elements converge to allow us to assume that in Paris, in the early 1540s, there was a project to create a royal printing house and that Claude Garamond was involved in it. But alas, this royal project was never carried out. In spite of the commission established in September 1539, nothing had been done by July 1542 when King Francis declared war on the Emperor Charles V. The conflict lasted four years. This war took up most of all the royal finances and under such conditions, the cost of the project appeared outlandish the king had no choice but to revise his priorities. At the end of 1542, the projected royal college was abandoned. The expulsion from the Hotel de Nel of Pierre Gauthier and Claude Garamond at the behest of Cellini shows the king's disengagement from this project. Gauthier and Garamond were set up on the Rue des Augustins at the beginning of the year 1543, so they stayed within the area of the Hotel de Nel while they were finishing the printing of Guido Guidi's Chirurgia. But their last hope were destroyed on the 22nd of May, 1544, 
when the king ordered the transfer of the royal library from Blois to the Chateau of Fontainebleau, making it impossible to have a sumptuous library open to the public in Paris. Fortunately, Jean de Gagny did not immediately abandon his protégé. In 1545, he persuaded Claude Garamond to become a bookseller by financing the publication of The Pia et Religiosa Meditatio by David Chamberlain. The book was printed by Pierre Gauthier with a preface written by Garamond, which is the only known text written by him. Following this publication, Pierre Gauthier printed only in the year 1545 another 13 titles, of which eight were published in association with Claude Garamond. But Garamond soon returned to his core business, concentrating on engraving punches and selling mattresses. Even if the royal project has failed, Claude Garamond's reputation was now assured. The beauty of the Grec du Roi had impressed booksellers and their customers. Thanks to the royal favor he had received, he had received sorry, Garamond was now in a position to establish himself as the best engraver in this city, as Jean de Gagny put it in his last will. Garamond invented a new business model. Rather than trying to earn money by selling fonts of types, he devoted himself entirely to, to engraving punches and striking mattresses. He did not hesitate to sell mattresses, mattresses strikes to type founders who, who had become his customers rather, rather than his competitors. Thanks to this clever strategy, he enjoyed great, great success right up to the end of his life distributing his typeface on a massive scale. By the end of the 1540s, Garamond had such a dominant position in, Paris, in the Paris type market that there were almost no room for, the, for other engravers. Pierre Autin and Robert Grandjean were forced to leave the city to earn their living. Throughout his life, Garamond capitalized on the prestige brought to him by the memory of the Royal Commission of 1539 and 1540. He remembered this when he drew up his last will in 1561. The document preserved in the National Archives shows that Garamond had initially presented himself as a simple punch cutter, graveur et tailleur de lettres à imprimer. But in a last gasp, he asked the notary to add the three words for the king, pour le roi in the line spaces, remembering that he had been the royal punch cutter. By doing so, he recalled what he owed the king. Thank you for your attention. Ramy, thank you very much. That was a fascinating talk, and you've given us an insight into the convergence of artistry, craftsmanship, patronage, politics, all sort of seeming to come together. And you've tried to, <clears throat> I think, very successfully unravel it. Um, I'm sure there are questions in the room and also online. Let me just begin with one that I found myself thinking about. How does it work in terms of the division of labor? You have a punch cutter. You have a type founder. You have a printer. You then ultimately have a publisher. Um, <clears throat> how many people, say for instance with punch cutting, how many people would work in the atelier, in the workshop? Was Garamond the only master, or was he overseeing a division of labor? It's quite difficult to answer this question. Um, the First of all, the, the work of punch cutter and type founders changed in the 1530s in Paris. Because um, the, in the beginning of the 16th century, the situation is what um, Pierre Fritz called uh, in house typecasting. So the printers had their own type founders. At the in, beginning. Of yeah, this. at the beginning. And it seems that in the 1530s in Paris, uh, some type founders began to work alone uh, but, uh, um, with 
uh, having printers as clients. Um, but most of these type founders were not punch cutters. Uh, the punch cutters are very rare, in fact. And they could have been silversmiths or goldsmiths. Yes, of course. We know of a lot of uh, punch cutters who worked also as uh, what we call orfevre in French, or yes. Goldsmith. Yes. goldsmith. Um, Engra type engraving uh, is, you don't require a lot of people, I think. No. Uh, I, I would like to think that uh, Garamond was alone to cut his type, but he had several employees and apprentices um, because you don't have only punch cutting. You have the justification of mattresses, for instance, which is a very specific work. Yes. And we know of um, one of Garamond's apprentices, Paterne Roblo, who, uh, who is known as um, doing a mattresses justification for Garamond. And, and in fact, this is um, a work as important as the, the punch cutting, because even with the, the, best punch of the, the best punches of the world, if your mattresses are not well justified, your, your font is the best. unusable, yes. Yeah, so. and, and I was interested, I made a note, and I, if I did note it correctly, in a contract that you uh, reproduced for the Grec du Roi, he was being paid for each punch as it was produced. So it yes. might have been one punch at a time. Yes. Which would indicate perhaps he himself or not a large number of people involved. Yeah, I think he was Very alone special. to cut the, 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 the Grec du Roi. But the, the, in fact, the, 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 the history of the, the Greek type cut for Konrad Neobar I didn't have the time to tell it, but this Regia Greca Typographia, where is it? Sorry. This one. Um, it was a kind of, of a failure for, the, for the, the king because this type probably has been founded by the, the, by the royal treasures. And as Konrad Neobar died, his successor, uh, continue to use this type. And the, there was no uh, monopoly, uh, monopoly. monopoly of the use of the type for the royal Greek printers. And this is why they, decide, they decided in November 1540 to add a new type cut uh, for which the punches were not owned by Robert Estienne. The punches were given to Ange Vergès and then given to the royal treasure, treasure. This is why we still get them. Um, um, because it was a way for the king to ensure that this type was, uh, it was not Robert Estienne type, it was mm -hmm. the type for the, for the royal printer. Good, thank, thank you. Um, I'm sure there are questions. Yeah, hold on one minute. For the benefit of people following us <laughs> online, David Shaw is very kindly going to take the microphone down. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, you showed a photograph of Greek uh, type, um, which showed many uh, ligatures. How many characters were there in this font totally? It seemed enormous. In, in totality today, in the Imprimerie Nationale, they still have 1,430 uh, punches for the three body size of the Grec du Roi, which is about 400 uh, punches for one body of the Grec du Roi. Um, the difficult matter is that these punches, which are preserved in the Imprimerie Nationale, some of them have been cut uh, later by the engravers of the Imprimerie Nationale, and they are not dating from the 16th century, but but some of them are. Yeah, some of, some of them are, and uh, well, the, most of them are, and about 400 types for one body size uh, for the Greek Dura. Thank you. Um, Miriam. Uh, thank you very much, Remy. That was, that was fascinating. Um, I always thought, probably mistakenly, that punch cutting was um, 
a job, a profession completely separate, but you seem to have suggested that in Paris in the 1530s, bunch cutters and type founders were closely together. The same person might have done both. So how did punch cutters relate to seal engravers, cutters of binding tools, if at all? Um, we know of, the difficult thing is that we don't always know the name of the punch cutters and we, 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 lack, we, have, we lack of information, but we know that um, a lot of punch cutters worked as type founders. Garamon started as a type founder and then he, he decided that uh, he was only selling uh, uh, strikes of mattresses. We know about um, another punch cutter who worked for Jean de Gagny, Charles Chiffin. Uh, we know of him that he is a goldsmith originated from the city of Tours. Um, we know that he worked for the... the the royal money in Tours, they have a, a, a shop where they, they, they cut the, the coin, the coin uh, uh, to, to make money. Uh, so Charles Chiffin did all the, that kind of thing and he, he also cut uh, Italic types for Jean de Gagny and I think uh, Roman types for the uh, printers in Tours. Um, as far as I know, he never worked as a type founder. Um, he only cut the punches, and I'm, I don't think he was able to justify mattresses, for instance. His work was to cut the, the punches. So um, we have to, to, for each uh, punch cutter that we are interested, we have to check, and uh, I, don't, I can't be precise in my answer, sorry. But, uh, I, I would imagine that there will have been different levels of expertise um, in metal and in metal cutting and engraving. So there were the goldsmiths, the silversmiths, the workers in base metals. So for instance, with seal matrices, yes. I know, you got what you paid for. And if you wanted something very fine, you had a level of, of artistry that was far better than something more common. Uh, my, Assumption is that with punch cutting, you were dealing with very high quality craftsmen. Yes. For the most part. Yes. And um, the, the, we always, uh, we often talk about goldsmiths, but yes. the goldsmiths deal with very soft metals. Silver and gold are very soft. And uh, this is why, uh, um, how do you say it in English? Se seal, uh, seal, um, seal, ma seal maker, the, the people who, who cut the, the saw. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, they deal with uh, iron, and which is very hard, hard. metal. So um, yeah. I think it's... Uh, They're different skills with different materials. Yes. The uh, people making the coins, they're making dyes for coin stamps. Yes. Is the, the term you need. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, other, other questions? J Jenny Strassen. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. You sketched together a close family network active and perhaps making some of his skills more possible. Do you have the idea that this is a very close environment and do these people stray outside to your knowledge um, <laughs> in other activities or do they remain within that circle from what we know? I'm afraid I can't answer this question. Um, the involvement of Garamond in this, in Jean de Gagny's project is, uh, he must have been aware of something, I, I, I hope so. 
but I, I can't say more, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the sources are lacking. <laughs> David. Um, yes, I, I, it's more, not a question, more of a comment. I, I was struck by the role of François Premier's colleges, or the single college, yes. and their connection with the book trade. Because the, the 1530 uh, Collège des Lecteurs Royaux had a book trade implication. They needed Greek books. Yes. And pr printers did produce them. My chap, Pierre Vidou, yes. produced a number of Greek books for the syllabus at the, the 1530 Collège des Lecteurs Royaux. The, the, those are very uncommon books. They're not easy to find, and they're not very well known. But th th there's a, a continuity here of, of the, the need yes. for very specialized book production work over a, quite a long period of time. Yes, of course. But there are other examples. Um, uh, for instance, the, the, the creation of uh, the university in, uh, in Alcala de Henares and in, in Spain, uh, involved the creation of a print house for the who printed the, the, the very important polyglot Bible, the first polyglot Bible. Um, the creation of the, the Greek college in Rome involved also the creation of a print house. And we have the same in Louvain with the Collège, de, Collège Triangle, Trilingue uh, uh, de Louvain. So um, it was quite common, in fact, when you created a college, in, a humanist college, in the 16th century that you thought about uh, the creation of a print house. Um, what you said about the, the need for books, it is, I, I didn't have the time to, to tell it during the, the, the lecture, but the fact is that the production of Conrad Neobar and the production of Robert Estienne are very different. Conrad Neobar published small books for students small books that, are, that were affordable for students. Whereas the, 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 the books printed by Robert Estienne, Ex Bibliotheca Regia, they are not books for students. They, are, they must have been very expensive. So it is as if uh, Robert Estienne becoming royal printer for Greek uh, abandoned the production of the, of the books that the royal teachers needed, in fact. And the truth is that uh, the royal, te royal teachers n never asked Robert Estienne to, to print uh, text for them. They worked with other printers. So there was a, a disconnection between the, the Collège des Lecteurs Royaux and Robert Estienne production. Ah, yes, we have a couple of related questions from the online audience, from David McFarlane and also Stephen Rawls. Do you know uh, how much time it would have taken Garmont to cut each punch? <laughs> <laughs> this is, it's, it's, uh, it, I think the, the feeling is that he seems to have produced them very quickly. Yes, this question has been debated. Uh, we, I think it, it was, was it Ari Carter who say, spoke about one punch a day for a, for a punch cutter? So, um, but uh, punches are different things. Uh, in this picture, you see punches which must have been quite simple to cut and others that, could have, that must have been difficult. The, for instance, what makes me smile is the fact that in this, in the Grec du Roi, um, each different accent necessitated the cutting of a particular punch. But the truth is that when Garamon cut Roman types, he used a mobile accent. I don't know how to say it. So he knew the technique, but as he was paid uh, per punch, he didn't use the technique for, for this case. I think it's, it, was, it was what happened um, because he knew how to do. So um, 
he must yeah he, he, he was quite a productive uh, uh, worker but he had several apprentices so um, I think the apprentice may have started the work yeah, yeah, yeah. and the master have finished the, the cutting maybe I and and the material of the punches was steel it was steel yes but soft steel the the steel was the steel is soft when you cut it, and, and then you and then you, you harden it by uh, with heat. Yes, we, we say trempe in French. Uh. Well, I'm holding the microphone. I just want to let you know that there were a number of comments in the chat that said thank you, and they thought it was a wonderful <laughs> talk, and they and thank uh, you so very lots much. Lots of very positive. I will, um, I will read read the chat. <laughs> Any, any other questions? I'm sure um, Remy will be happy to continue this conversation over a glass or two of wine outside. Yes. But all that really remains for me to do is to thank you for coming and visiting us. Thank and you. And we're extremely grateful. And uh, please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. <laughs>